Hannah, you're on mute, it looks like. Okay, thank you, Erin. Yeah. Okay, good now? All yep, right. I can, I can hear you. Perfect, man, and I had just like answered every Canvas question that they had all in that 20 seconds, and now I can't remember all the answers. Just kidding. Okay. <laughs> If only it were that easy, right? All right, so um, we are going to be looking at creating a home page. So um, this we've made some templates for you as far as a classroom teacher's home page would look. This doesn't mean that if you're not a classroom teacher that none of this will apply because we will be showing you just how to customize customize home pages in general. So um, we actually have a homepage course that we've put out into the commons that will show you where to go and get that. So if you want to actually import that into a pretend course and start working on it and customizing it yourself, you are welcome to do that. Um, I will tell you this homepage has been through many, many, many revisions and we've gotten it to the best of our ability for right now. Um, I'm sure that there's probably still some things that we could work on to make better. And if you have questions or suggestions, suggestions or things like that, we're certainly open to those as well. Um, so I did want to just do a quick review over what we did this morning, but not go into too much um, because a lot of you that are here have already been through two and a half hours of training today. Um, so just as a reminder, when you want to get to Canvas, you can go to your fz.k12 bookmarks and click on your little Canvas icon, and that is going to take you to your dashboard. These are courses that you are either enrolled in as a teacher or as a student that you have chosen to uh, have on your dashboard page. A published course just means that this is a course that if students were in the course, that they could access the material. An unpublished course um, is a course where if uh, you're just playing around with it, you can still play around with published courses because if you don't actually have any students in the course, then there's nothing that actually students can do. So at this point, if you're just creating for 10 courses, it doesn't really matter if they are published versus unpublished. It will only matter when your courses get pushed in from SIS and then they'll need to be published for students. And if they'll be published when they come in from SIS or not automatically, that we don't know. All right, so just as a reminder too, on your courses, these are the courses that I've chosen to have show up on my dashboard. But when I go to all courses, I have the list of every course that I'm in, including past courses. And if you want to view or hide things on your dashboard, that's where you're just clicking on these little stars. So I only have on my dashboard the things that I have starred. And that can be helpful for students too, because they might have courses that they're enrolled in that they're not using. Um, it, let's say, for example, they're a face to face student and their PE teacher does not use Canvas um, and, and face to face classes. So that could be a course that maybe we take off of the dashboard for them. For our, our all virtual students, um, our suggestion is to keep the classroom home page course the one that is on the dashboard and link to the other courses from the home page so that students when they come in um, to their virtual classroom every day they are always starting at the home page so then the question is what does that home page look like so here is the home page template course that we have created for you um, and this is how it's going to be named and looked in the comments when i'll show you how to do that in a little bit so if I click on that course, it starts off with a welcome page. Um, and this page is an overview of what is inside of the course. So it tells you um, if you want to view the different templates to click on pages and then view all pages. So if I click on the pages section over here and then I click on view all pages, that's where I'm going to get to my templates that are available. Okay. Let me go back there. All right. And then um, there is a slideshow here of some directions on how to use the templates. We are actually going to be going through this information today. And then we're going to be adding some um, walkthrough videos for people that are doing this later 
um, that they could watch these videos as well. Um, I had videos created, but then we had to redesign the homepage because some of the th things we thought would work didn't actually work right uh, the way we thought they would in Canvas. So um, unfortunately, what I had made is no longer useful. So um, I found that out very recently. So we will um, get that updated. So when we're looking at the um, homepage option, so you see that that you have camping, you have space, you have CRAN. So these are the um, home pages that you have the options to use. So this is the camping one. Um, the other pages are set up the same way. So the buttons are in the same place. They link to the same things. It's just that um, they have a different design. So you have space. So here's the space theme. And then there's crayons. And it looks like there's some of that got duplicated. So we'll take out those duplicates. All right, and there's the crayons version. So you notice the layout of the page is um, the same, even if the design of the different icons is different. All right, so here is how the page was set up. Now keep in mind, this was set up for, this was originally created for the fully virtual students to use because they are the ones that are going to have all of their content that is going to be um, needing to access online. They're gonna to need to access the daily schedule online and links to the different assignments that they're going to be completing online. So originally we had thought, okay, we'll make one homepage that's for virtual students and one homepage for face-to-face -face students. And they'll be different. However, the issue that we discussed, and this was the teachers that were helping make the virtual curriculum, and then Heather uh, Krieger and Stephanie Sanker were all part of many discussions on this. Um, the issue is at some point, we don't know, your class may end up having to go virtual. There's just so many unknowns with that this year that it was decided that it would be best to make this page to where how it could be used in a fully virtual environment with the realization that a face-to-face -face teacher might not utilize everything that's in here to the same extent that a fully virtual teacher would. Um, because in a normal world where you're a classroom teacher and you are just using this kind of on an as-needed basis, you might arrange, you might have arranged some of these things differently. Like instead of Monday through Friday, you might have put subject areas or things like that because you're in class with those kids to say, hey, now it's time to go to science, so go to the homepage and click on science. However, we didn't want it to, to design it one way, and then your class ends up virtual, and then you have to completely redesign your page. So even though we understand that um, this is set up more for the fully virtual teachers, um, as a face-to-face -face teacher, we're just going to show you what components of it that you may choose to use for now but at least it'll be set up so that it could be used in a fully virtual setting. Aaron, do you think there's anything more I need to add to that part of it, the intro part of it? No, I think you're good. You're moving okay. into where to show them how to get this, correct? Yes, so I'm gonna first show them um, what it does and what it looks like and how all the links are, and then I'm going to show them how to actually get it for themselves. Perfect. Okay. All right. So the top page is a banner. Um, this can be any design. So the camping theme, um, there was somebody that was kind enough that shared this in one of the many Canvas groups that I am in online and had all of these already created for the three themes, the camping and the space and the crayon. So I thought, who is instead of starting from scratch, I'm going to use um, some of their banners to get me started. Now, if you are wanting to use the camping theme and you just want to change this heading part and you like the look of all of the other buttons, the simplest thing to do would just be to click on that drive folder. And then this is going to take you to the drive folder that has all of the different grade levels in it, okay? And then you could then um, add your that applies to your classroom. So if you want to do that, so let's say you're a third grade teacher 
and you're going to say, okay, I like the camping theme. I want to keep everything else the same. The only thing I want to change is this banner here. Okay, and that's the simplest way that you could use this page is to only change the banner of the page and keep everything else the same. And then we'll go into kind of moving up levels of you know, other things that you could add and more customization you could do. So if that were the case, I'm going to click on this. Now, in order to get it into Canvas, um, by far the easiest way is to just download the item. So I'm gonna click on my download button and you can see it downloaded the picture file right here. Then I'm going to come back in here, press my edit button. Okay. And then I'm just going to click on this one and I'm going to delete it. I can also delete this heading information. I can click on embed image. I'm going to get this into my canvas files. Okay. And I'm going to click on upload file. And so let me go back to my downloads here. So I downloaded this picture. So this is the first thing on the top of my downloads. I click open. It's going to load it into canvas itself. So the other nice thing is for some reason you delete it. You don't have to re-download it because it's been saved to your canvas files now. So it would be in this canvas folder now, which is good. Um, it already has the dimension set. These are dimensions in pixels. That's how the arrangement is 1200 pixels wide, 300 pixels tall. I click update and there is my banner. So if that was the only thing I wanted to, if I wanted to just keep the template and just change the heading, that is the simplest way that you can customize a page. Now I'm gonna press cancel on this because I do not want to customize my template right now. Um, and then your Monday through Friday buttons, these link to schedules for those days. Now this was another discussion that um, was had when the virtual teachers and Heather and Stephanie were all, um, and I were all working on this together, is should these say letter days or should these say days of the week? And I realize that letter days is probably easier on the teacher end for organization, but with a fully virtual classroom, you're trying to make this work as simply as possible for parents. And unfortunately, parents just don't get that A through E day the way that we would like them to. It doesn't seem to matter how long we've been doing it. It's just more complicated for them to go by letter day. So if this ended up, you know, that this was a day, but this was a Friday underneath, that just ends up being a little too complicated for parents trying to help their kids learn virtually at home. So that's why we went ahead and went with the days of the week. And then underneath those days, you can just type. This isn't something embedded. This is just typed into the page using the text editor that's already built into Canvas. And you can just add your dates in your letter days. So these down here would then change depending on the week and depending on which day is A, B, C, D, and E. So then if I click on a date, that is going to take me to the schedule for that particular day. So um, the way that it's set up right now is it's set up as a sample schedule full for a fully virtual student. So it has the times, the subjects, when the live meeting time is and materials that would be needed for that live meeting. So then the teacher could go in and press edit and they can then just type in all the information that they need. So if there's a link to a WebEx meeting, so if your morning meeting is in your personal room, you could just put a link here um, to your personal room so that students can come to that meeting. Um, you can tell them you know, things they need to bring. And then these subject areas would then link to the modules pages of each particular subject. And this has to be done by teacher. This is not linking that we can set up for you in advance because this links to a particular classroom in SIS. 
So for you, actually, even if you bring this over today and you start working on the customizing of it, you do not have the ability to link these to your CIS courses yet because your courses haven't been pulled in through CIS. And each course has a unique um, URL. So this is the, this page, this web page right here. So each page um, in, within Canvas is basically its own web page. So in order to be able to link, you ha would have to be able to get to your reading course and your modules page and get the link to that page. So since we can't do that yet, um, I just wanted to let you know that's something you would need to set up, um, but it's not gonna be available until your courses have been brought in through SIS. So you can see here is your basic schedule. Now, if you are a classroom teacher, you might be thinking, well, I don't necessarily want to put my whole schedule out for the day. Um, that is up to you as far as how much of this that you use. What you could do is just set it up to where these link to your um, course modules. And then instead of you know worrying about typing out materials and things like that, because you'll be with students in class to tell them those things, what you could do instead is just say, hey, we have a reading lesson that is in Canvas today. So what we're going to do as a class, let me go back to our homepage. All right, so camping theme right here, here we go. So instead of saying, you know, instead of worrying about making the whole schedule, and just to get students used to the platform. So remember, that's the other thing is if we have to go virtual, these face-to-face -face kids are, we want them to be able to say that they've seen this before, even if it's just the teacher modeling this, even if the students don't have their own, you know, devices one-to-one -one K3, even if as you as a teacher, you're just putting some of your content into Canvas that you want to display to students, just the more opportunities they can get their eyes on the page is just going to benefit you in the long run. So you could then just tell them to go to Monday and click on the reading button button because our reading lesson is through Canvas today. Um, even if you didn't have, you know, lessons built for every subject area, but you had it built for one subject area, you could just have them go to that particular link. That way they're at least getting some um, exposure to how this looks and they're getting some practice with clicking on things and completing things in Canvas. Now, the way it's set up here is this home button then takes you back to that home page for camping. Um, just so that you noticed here, if I go to the schedule, the um, three themes all link back, um, all link to these pages. So if you are using the space theme or if you are using the crayons theme, if you click on Monday through Friday, they will all take you here. Um, but the home page right now is set to the camping home page. Um, and so we, you would need to redo some linking there to make that work. So that's how the Monday through Friday is set up. You have your Tuesday. So the schedule and all of this is the same. We just wanted to have a sample Monday through Friday pages created for you where you can then just go and add the linking later. Then we have the Clever page, and this is going to take them to their own personal Clever page. And if you um, are not super familiar with Clever, Clever helps us um, sign in students using their Google account. So if they click on Clever and then log in with Google, this is going to allow them to get to some um, district apps that we have purchased. So um, my understanding is Pearson is going to be one of those two. Um, that's what Stephanie's understanding was when I had um, messaged her after my first training. Um, student have, students will be getting individual brain pop accounts. At least that's what they told us that they're planning on doing. Um, there's typing that the tech teachers use that go through um, Clever. Uh, so any of those things to where students would need to have their uh, account authenticated through Clever, that's what that button is for. It also can be used because you might have noticed that no longer is that lovely Symbolu page the homepage for our elementary students with all the little images and icons on it. 
Um, that was something that um, those above us were very, very adamant that they did not want to have as the homepage. Um, we asked, we promised. But what can be done is you can then customize this clever page for your building. So you can see some of the icons to different games and different um, things are located here. So this is kind of your alternative to that, uh, to that Symbaloo page that students used to have as their homepage. Yes, Erin. Um, can you speak to specials and having that linked? Now this that you're showing right now is currently for a virtual teacher. The in-person teachers shouldn't really need to do that if we're in-person, but I don't remember what we landed on in terms of when we go virtual, how that would go. You're talking about for classroom teachers or for specialists? Right, for classroom teachers linking specials or will the students be accessing specials from the dashboard in its own separate course? Okay, so that was another conversation because we used to have specials on here, but then you would have to actually get the link from the specialist teachers and attach that to your page because you are not the teacher of the specialist course. And it would give students more things to click on from their homepage and we feel like there's enough things to click on here. So as the tech teachers, our plan is to work with students on really managing this dashboard and understanding how this dashboard works. So like for technology class, our plan is to have students start at the dashboard and have a very easy to find image that is their technology class image. So we're teaching them in technology class to go, because this is their landing page, to go to the dashboard for technology class. Does that answer you think what? Yes, I yes, that does. Also, okay. I did have a good idea sent to me um, okay. in person yeah, teachers. Yeah, maybe we can use Canvas for homework while we're in person so okay. that parents are getting, you know, used to it with their kids, not necessarily all the time, but could right. be something that you just kind of throw in there every once in a while. Yeah, that's a great idea. Like, like we said, I mean, any more exposure that, you know, we don't want you to have to create everything in Canvas if we're also creating, you know, face-to-face -face lessons too. We realize that that um, may be too much, but the more exposure we can give them just because of the uncertainties of what may happen, we just think the more eyes, times they can get their eyes on this page and see how the, this page works is going to be the better. Thank you, Erin, and thanks for that idea, whoever's idea that was. I love it. Um, another button that's on here is a past learning because we realize that while you have this week set up, there may be students that were absent for any particular reason, quarantine or otherwise, and they may need to access what was done in previous days. So there is a more simple version of what we're going to show you. And there is a more advanced version of what we're going to show you um, to as far as what some ideas are for this page. So when I click on past learning, here is a, oops, you know what? I think I need to relink that page. Let me do that real quick. So you're gonna see how we link a page in here. We made some changes at the last second here. So if I click on this uh, past learning button, and I want to link it to a page that already exists in my course. Now, this is different than linking to a page in a different course. But if I want to link it to a page that already exists in my course, it's like I had planned this on purpose, even though I didn't. Um, I would click on my pages that are in my course and I can search for the page that I am looking for. So this is past learning subjects. And somehow, Erin, everything is in here twice. I'm not sure how it got duplicated since, uh, you know, 1030 last night when we were working on it, but that's okay. We can remove duplicates. Um, so then I'm going to press save. You always need to make sure to save here. So now if I click on past learning. There we go. That is my past learning subjects page. So the simplest way for you as a teacher to set this up is to just add links just like you did on that um, calendar. I'm sorry, on that, yeah, that schedule for the day, like that Monday schedule, that Tuesday schedule, 
you had these going to the modules for each subject is just to have it linked to that. The tricky part of that is for parents, then they have to go to each subject area to find what was missed on those particular days. But it's a lot easier for you as a teacher because you only have to set up these links once, okay? So that's one option. The second option is to give parents a calendar view and link a copy of each day's page to the calendar. So here's another option here. Hopefully this page works. Yep, here we go. So these were some calendars that we found free in the comments. Um, so we decided not to recreate. And if you go to edit here, you can see that any of these images, you can create a link to that image. So if you were to do it that way, let me go back in as if we were starting from the beginning here. So let's say that you are finished with Monday, okay? And you want the students that were gone on this day to have access to all of the links and everything that was listed for the day. So basically you're going to link this page to that day in the calendar, okay? And then if you go in and you um, edit this page or you make a copy of this page, then you can make a new Monday page for the next Monday, okay? So you'll have to do a copy at some point, which is copy to, keep putting your little box in the wrong spot, copy to, and then you can pick the same course that you're in. So it just stays in your course and it just makes a copy of it. So that's how you would make a copy of that page that you could then link to the calendar, okay? So if I go back to my home page here. So then in past learning, if I was using this calendar method, and I went to edit, so I would take the day that I wanted to link. So whatever, so I guess it was the 24th is our first day, but it may not be our first day anymore. We will find out. Um, and then I'd be looking for that page here. And then what I would do then is I would link, and if I had a copy of it, I probably wanna link the copy so I don't mess up um, my original page. Um, and I would link the copy of it to the 24th so that parents would know exactly, see that whole schedule for the day. So that is the more advanced option. It requires more work on your part to link each day's um, work to the calendar, but it's going to be easier for parents. And this may be something too, where it may depend on if you are face-to-face -face or virtual, what works best for you in your classroom. Um, as Aaron, you can tell me if you've heard differently. As far as I know, we haven't been told it has to be done a specific way with the past learning. We just know parents need to be able to access past learning, correct? Yeah. Yes, that is the last I heard also. Okay. So, and it's possible that something that does get changed where they say we want this done a certain way or maybe the school year gets started and parents are, you know, asking for things to be done a certain way. Um, but remember, we're just telling you what we know to be true at this exact point in time. So that's what we know to be true right now. All right, the next thing is the My Classroom page. This will take you to a page of your own personal design. So if you have um, you know, your Bitmoji classroom, if you wanna put a newsletter here, if you wanna put extra resources or like if there's extra you know, enrichment games and activities and things you want to have links to, this page is yours to freely design. You can use whatever theme that you want. Um, just really make it your own. So whatever you information that you think is helpful to share with parents that you would normally share with parents, like maybe in a newsletter or something like that, that is all information that can go here on the My Classroom page. So we gave you some ideas. It doesn't mean it has to look exactly that way. That was one where Heather and Stephanie were like, let the teachers let them make the choices on that page of what they want to include because for every classroom, it could be different. 
Did you have something to add, Erin? Yeah, um, there was a good question here. It said for virtual teachers, they're going to end up having a lot of pages as the year goes on. So is there a way to archive pages from months ago so that they don't appear in the drop down for you to scroll through? Ooh, that is a great question. Um, I that, just checked and I mean, you can only like unpublish pages, but they're still showing up in your, in in your teachers. Yeah. Yes. The only thing I can think, Erin, is maybe you could copy those pages to like an archive course that you make or something like that. Yeah, um, and that could be an option pulling. like after first, you know, quarters done. And if you want to, just move those page over to a course that's just a sample course that you create so you still have them, but they're not taking up space. That's a, yeah. the only thing I, I can think of at this point in time. It's a great question though, and not one that I have a better answer for at this time, but it's certainly something we can investigate more. Yes, and again, I would say that would be a good point as to why it's good to name your pages very yes. specifically because then you'll be able to find them and they sort alphabetically yeah you know, by default on there so yes. just another can you question. change i think you can can you change the sorting of that oops i'm on the wrong thing pages let's see here it doesn't look like well it looks like you can hit the arrows here so if you want to sort by last edited or creation date or page title so if you click on the little headings there, that's how you can choose the way that it's sorted. It looks like those are your only options so that I can see. So yeah, so that would be helpful if you just are always choosing last edit, then the last right. page is always gonna be at the top. Yep. Okay, yeah, all these, these management type of questions, these are really great things for us to be thinking about since we've never used this before and it's housed differently than it was, things were in house in Google Classroom. So thank you for those questions and if we, can find some better solutions, um, we will certainly add them to the training materials. Um, one thing I'm going to show you real quick before I forget on the training website that JB um, made for us on this level two, which um, is about pages. That's going to take you to the information about creating pages, and it's also going to have elementary stuff in here too, which is also on the homepage course that I designed, but it has multiple ways for you to get to it. So we can, if we find other great information about pages, we can certainly add that into our creating and managing pages slideshow. Okay. Um, the My School button is going to be a school choice as far as what your principal wants that link to. Um, Nick mentioned some principals might want to do a principal's corner, or maybe it'll just link to the website for your school on our district websites. Um, it, it may link to like if your if your principal wants to have their own website where they're updating information like that is totally going to be up to you in a school decision. Um, we were just told that there needs to be a button there. We have not been told anything more as far as what exactly needs to be um, linked to that button. Um, and then the last one, the MyFZSD, this one is going to link just to the district website for now, unless there ends up being, being a more specific Fort Zumwalt link that they want us to put in later. Then um, one of the things that was discussed at the um, elementary trainers meeting last week was it would be nice to have a area for tech support. Because we originally thought about putting that under my classroom. But we thought for parents, um, it might be helpful to have that as its own specific icon. So um, the way that we're looking at this page is we try to put the things that students would need to view that came up when that page came up without having to scroll. Anything that's more for parents is going to be what you would scroll down and see at the bottom. So all of this at the bottom is really more for parents than it is for students but it's a way to house it all in one place. So parents, you know, the whole one, the whole main things about using Canvas was the parent communication and parents only being able to get, have to go to one place to get everything they need. So that's kind of how that page was set up that way. But this tech support does not have a link yet. <laughs> JB said that he is planning on creating a tech support-ish um, website for parents where we can put you know, video tutorials and different things like that. 
Um, but since that page is not yet created, we do not have any link to that page yet. So it's just a blank button at the moment. Yes, Erin. We um, Amber just said that on a Chromebook, the only thing that shows is the banner initially. So just as a heads up, okay. kids might have to scroll just a little bit to get to a their data. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for checking that, Amber. Yeah, and it's different. Um, the other thing is it takes up space that annoys me about Canvas is there's no way to get rid of this heading because whatever you name the page automatically comes up here. Um, so, and unfortunately that takes up, you know, a couple inches of space, which I know for the people that created Canvas, they probably weren't thinking about those things that us elementary teachers are more concerned about, but, you know, that's okay. All right. So that is the basics of how this page is set up. Um, and then I want to show you how to get to this homeroom course template um, within the commons itself and then import it into a sample class where you can then work on editing it. Um, because remember, you have the opportunity, and this is for true for any of those three templates. I keep showing this camping one because I know the linking, um, and I worked on making the linking work for all of these last night, but just in case. Um, so you'll see that, you know, we want what, what Heather and Stephanie told us, if they want the, all the teachers to have these buttons in place and they want there to be, you know, Canvas, Past Learning, My Classroom, My School, My FCSD. If you want to redesign the look of them, you are certainly welcome to. If you want to make this my school, have a picture of your school or your school colors or something like that, you are welcome to do that. If you want to redesign the look of any of these buttons, and that's what they're called. These icons in Canvas are called buttons because they link to other things. Um, you can redesign any of this as much. You could go with a completely different theme if you wanted. The idea of creating some templates for you, though, was so that, number one, if you only wanted to change the heading um, and keep all of the rest of the look of it the same, you could. Um, it also gave you an organization for if you are creating your own things, you know where they need to go. Erin, um, do you think there's anything else I need to talk through before I have them um, I show them how to go out to Canvas and, or sorry, to the Commons and actually pull this into a course. I think you're good. Okay. Um, so then once we actually pull it in, um, then I'll talk to you about how you can um, do some more customizing and linking and link from one course to another course and some of those kinds of things. Um, but I wanted you to have your own version of it first before we go into too much of that. So um, I'm going to show you how to do this with the comments and then I, we're actually going to take a couple minute break, just like we had a break plan for our last session this morning. Um, but this time during this session, we'll probably do about 10 minutes because I want you to have time to actually go in, get this from the comments, bring it into your course. And that way, if you have any issues with that, you can put some you know, questions and things in the Q&A that we can then address if needed. But then once you, we come back from that break and you've got it pulled in, we'll talk more about customizing and what that entails and how to do the linking and such like that. But then you at least will have your own copy to work with. All right, so if you go to the comments and let me say this first, make sure you have a, play, a, a pretend course that you can send this to because you don't have any course to send it to, then if you go to the comments, it won't have any place to go. So just as a reminder, if you want to make a pretend course, you go to courses, all courses, press the plus course button, give it a name, whatever you wanna call it, and then just press create course. And then you'll have a course that you can import content to. All right, so I'm gonna go to the comments. The easiest way to find the information is to just search by my name since I'm the one that put it out there. So if you type in Hannah Dykeson, D-Y-K-S-E-N, um, then this should be the only thing that pops up. So it's called FCSD Elementary Homepage Templates, listed for kindergarten through fifth grade. This is the image for that. So if this is what you see, that's exactly where you need to be. And then I'm going to click on the title of the course and then my, and it kind of gives you a preview of what's in the course. So these are all the pages that come with it. 
<coughs> excuse me. And then I'm going to press import download. And I'm going to choose my pretend course that I created for it. So I'm going to choose my afternoon pretend course. That's where I want to import the template. I did also want to point this updates button. So if I make changes to the actual pages here, and I want people to get access to those pages, when you go back to the comments, it'll have an update and it'll have a number next to it. Um, and you'll be able to click on that and actually get any updated pages that have been added to the to this template. Um, Cause here's the thing, we did as much work as we could to get this as ready as we could in time for you. It's been through so many revisions and changes. Like I thought I was done with this a, a week, week and a half ago, and then it, the structure didn't work and now we completely restarted. So, um, you know, if there's anything else that we realize needs to be added to that course, we can add it and then you can just go back to the comments and get the updates for it. But this is what we have in the course so far and it doesn't have all those duplicates, which is good. It just has the main pages. And then I'm going to click on import into this course. Now it does say it started and may take a little while to see changes in your course. So the bigger the amount that you're pulling in that you're importing from the commons will be how long it takes for that importing process to actually happen. So if you, you know, this one has several pages, so it, you know, probably won't take too long, but if you had something where you're pulling in like entire coursework worth of information that could take a little longer. So let me check my afternoon pretend course and see if it's pulled in yet. Yep, looks like it's there. So this was a course that didn't have anything in it until I went to the comments. And so now in this pretend course, if I go to pages and view all the pages, everything that I had in that pretend course is all listed here. So it's all where it needs to be. All right, so with that in mind, we're gonna give you a chance. I'm gonna leave this up on my screen. So you can remember what you're looking for. So we're gonna give you a chance to go to the comments and grab that course if you would like. Um, we'll also take a break so that you can get a drink and stand up a little bit and things like that. We'll also give you a chance to ask any questions that you might have. Um, and then we will come back here at 1255.
All right, it is 1255. So we are going to go ahead and resume our recording and continue on with our training. All right, I think I've turned off video, but not my sound this time. We will find out, hopefully so. All right, so I'm going to go now into the course that I imported this home plate template into. Um, it looks like from our Q&A that um, you guys were, some of you were able to be successful in that. So that's awesome. So I'm going to go to my afternoon pretend course. All right, so let's look at, and this will work for any template that you choose. So I'm just sticking with the one that I've been talking about, which is the camping one, but this is true for the space or the crayons one as well. Each of them has a um, heading that you can customize. And like on this crayons one, this is going to take you to a copy of Google Drawings where you can change this to welcome to, you know, Miss Dyson's class or put your name there. Um, and then you could keep all those things the same or you can completely re redesign the buttons because as you see on here, I do have, um, we will have a link to that Canvas course with all of these homepage templates. And it looks like Aaron, that that was an update that I did not get in there before the course was sent to common. So um, I will tell you though, there's another way to get there and see if that's also in there. So if you wanna to get to this um, with all of the elementary stuff, that is in, so if I go to Canvas level two on that training website, and then I go to the elementary Canvas stuff, that's where it is. So it's in the same section as all the pages set stuff, and that will take you to all of the options here. So there are, five full themes that and we and I created pages for three of them. Um, there's also one that was shared with me, the gray hexagons. I kind of thought that the gray was a little bit boring. I know you could change the color. So I think that's meant for, you know, if you wanted to go in canvas, you wanted to go and change colors. And then there's a watercolor one. Um, the reason I didn't choose this one, um, because if this is going to be for K-5, I felt like the text was really difficult for our younger kids to read, and we wanted to keep it as simple as possible, especially for those 100% virtual kids. So I'm not saying that you can't use this um, theme. I'm just saying be careful if you're a parent of, or if you're a teacher of younger kids, as far as everyone being able to read it. Now there are some other things in here as well. If you want, I made this the size of a day button. So like the Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday button that is set to this size in Google Drawing. So if you wanted to create your own button from scratch here, um, then you could certainly do that in Google Drawings and download it and then upload it to your course. There are some pencil buttons that somebody shared. Now you would have to download each of these as separate image files, file, download, image, okay? And then each of these would be a separate page that would download. So you could do that. Your other option for people that really wanna get fancy, and if you're not one of those people, you can just close your ears right now and just ignore what I'm going to say. But for some people that really get into the design, and I know like Erin is one of those people, I'm she's already done a lot of designing for her course and I'm sure she'll do more, um, is these were made in a website called Canva, not to be confused with Canvas. I have no idea why I ended up with two names that were so similar, but Canva is a website where you can create um, your own icons. So a lot of the things that I created that hadn't been shared with me that I had to go recreate or make it work for like the, my school, my FDSD, um, those buttons were all were created in Canva itself. So if you want to get some of these buttons, you would need to put this web address into your computer. So you copy and paste it from the bottom and then the, this is a Canva template that a teacher was nice enough to share 
you need to use their template and then you can edit it and then you can use their Canva's download button. Now I have a Canva account. There is um, free accounts for teachers. I don't know, I'm guessing that you would have to have a Canva account to be able to access those templates, but it is free to set up an account. So if you're somebody that wants to get real fancy with your design of your pages, you could design in Google Drawings and use this as a button template, or you could design in um, Canva as well. So there's lots of options there. Um, one of the things that I will say is also helpful with these themes that we brought in, um, the person that created them was nice enough to list out the color codes, the um, fonts, and yes, they were created with Canva, and also the, the sizes. So if you're creating your own thing, the banner across the top, that's the size, and then the square buttons are those sizes. We didn't use any of the larger size buttons. We just have the banner and the square or circle buttons are those sizes. So that's kind of how that whole templates theme part works as far as accessing other um, themes that are already here or creating your own buttons. Erin, do you have anything more you think I need to say about that particular folder of stuff? Um, no, I think you pretty much nailed it. I don't know, okay. may have missed you saying this, but Canva does give teachers a free pro account if you yes. You did say that. Well, I, I said that teachers can have a free account, but yes, you're right. It's not just because they there's Canva free accounts and then there's Canva pro accounts, but as a teacher, you get a free pro account. So I should clarify that. Thank you. Yes. And you just have to send in like a, there's like a little application looking kind of thing. If you just Google search educator pro account for Canva or whatever, then um, they just ask for like a picture of your school ID or something. Mm -hmm. I think it took like what, 24 hours for them to send me the email saying I got my free pro. Yes, I, yeah, I think someone actually physically looks and makes sure that it's legit before they grant you access. So, <laughs> you know, it's their company. I can't blame them for that. Right. Uh, yeah. So, so that's for people that really want to get into the designing. Um, you could use that for your, you know, home page, uh, your classroom page, I mean, as far as where it says my classroom, if you want to design that in Canva, you could people design things in Google drawings and Google slides as well. And those things can also look really awesome. So if you would prefer to design in slides or design in drawings and do it that way, you certainly are welcome to do that. Okay. So let's take a look if I wanted to take one of these pages. So this is in my own course now, so I'm not going to mess up the templates. And let's say that I wanted to bring in a completely different theme. So I no longer wanted to use the rocket theme. Instead, I wanted to use that watercolor theme, for example. Just be careful on, I really like, it's really a pretty theme. Just be careful as far as can your kids actually read it and the whole accessibility and, and reading thing. Okay. So let's say that I was fourth grade or fifth grade, whichever one comes up. So I'm going to download this. And then I'm going to come back to my page. Oops, wrong Canvas page. Okay. Then I'm going to go to embed image, go to Canvas, um, and I'm going to upload it to my files. And because it was one of the last things downloaded, it will be there. It's already set to the same dimensions, okay? And once again, for alternate um, text, if you want, as far as a screen reader, you could put your alternate text here, okay? And then press update. And so now you've changed this particular page, or this particular banner, I should say. Um, this can be, you know, something that's created in slides or drawings as well. We're not saying that you have to get it from that folder. We're not saying that you have to get it from Canva. We're just trying to give you some pre-built things if you don't want to go to all the trouble, but let you have some flexibility if you do. All right, and then the next thing are these particular buttons. Now, one thing I wanna point out to you is that these are actually all tables, okay? So the Monday through Friday is all in the table. 
these two icons are in a table and you see little dotted lines there because I've hidden the borders of the table. I feel like that gives it a better look on the page. So when I'm going here, I don't see the lines in between. I can't tell that this was originally a table. Um, that does make it look a little funkier in the editing screen, however, because it makes it look like these things are out here, even though when you press save, they're actually not. And that's simply because the Hat Canvas seems to struggle when you take away the borders of things of keeping them lined up in your edit screen. So before you freak out and feel like you've messed everything up because it's not lined up, just hit that save button and go, oh, okay, this is actually still here. This is actually still okay. Everything is all right. All right. So then if I wanted to delete e these images here, I can just get rid of that. Oops, I need to come here and download what I need first. Yes. Hey, when you um, get one of those images in there, can you show where you hid the table lines? Yes, that is a great question. Thank you. And I meant to do that and then I forgot. So thank you. Okay. So now I'm going to Canvas. I'm going to upload this Monday picture to my files. And then remember too, the nice thing is, is if you somehow delete it, it's in your Canvas files. Now you don't have to come back here to put it back in. All right, so then that would take the place. So then you're just going through and you're replacing the images, the icons. Now, don't forget though, that you also have to relink these pages to where you want them to go. Because when you delete the image and replace a new image, you've also deleted the link that that image originally had. So I would wanna make sure that I came to my pages here and that I found my Monday page that I wanted to link to, and then I press that Monday so that that yellow means that it has the relinking and you'll see here that little arrow means that it's linked. So you'll know that you actually did the linking process there. And then remember, this is just text. Okay. All right. So border properties. So how do this, how does that work? So originally when you put in a table, it sets the border to be one. Um, we changed the border to zero. So if I want to go back so you can see here, I have my lines here again. And then I also, in advance, I put the border as hidden. Um, so that takes away those lines in between too. So if I just set the border to zero, it gets rid of the border on the outside. And then if I set it to hidden as well, it gets rid of all the lines in the middle. So I did both things to make it look like there was no table there. I changed this one to zero. And I came into advance and I checked hidden on the border. And these are the things that we're going to make some redo some screencasts on that we can put into our slideshow for everybody that's not here and needs to rewatch it. All right, but if you originally put a table in, this would be set to one and this would be set to like a solid color. And you do see there are some other options. So you can play around with it and decide you may like to have a certain kind of lines there and that's fine. If you want to have lines in yours, you can. I just personally like the look of making it look like, you know, the table wasn't actually there. All right, so that's how you would set up that link and you could do the same thing with your classroom. You could redesign here, but just remember if this, like if you redesign a clever one and it's linked to the clever website, and you delete it and replace it, you're going to need to redo that link to Clever's website if you replace it. So anything you replace, you need to also relink. Now, you only have to do it once, um, so keep that in mind, but you just wanna make sure that you don't delete things and forget to relink where they need to actually go. Now, I'm gonna go into an actual day, because I relinked this to this one, because we need to also talk linking from one course to another course because that is a little different process than linking to a page that's already in the same course because we're pretending as if we are in our homeroom course but these icons need to link to our lessons in different courses all right so let's look at that so i'm going to hit edit all right 
So I'm going to click on this button and it's going to be a URL. Because once again, if I go here and I go to modules, no results because I don't have anything set up in this homeroom course that are modules that are lessons. My modules, my lessons for reading are found in my reading course. So I am going to be using a URL link and the way I'm going to get to that. So I'm just going to pretend as if we were doing this here. So I'm going to go to my fifth grade homeroom. Actually, it's easier to get to it from the dashboard. This homeroom course. And I'm going to say, I want to link this here. So my reading icon, I want to go to the reading modules page and i'm going to link this to that picture okay so that's what i'm attempting to do the way that you do that is you go to the modules page of the course that you want and you copy and paste the web address so if you look at the top here each course has a number code you don't normally need to do anything with that code but when you create a new course it's assigned a code number and then it has behind that code number whatever page it's on so what i'm saying here with this link is i'm sending kids to this course which happens to be this the course that i'm in and i'm sending them to the modules page of that course so i'm just going to copy and paste my control c to copy my control v to paste and to be clear they would see each module once they get to that page they're not just seeing a single module for the day or whatever they're seeing all of the modules for reading anything that you have yes now you can <laughs> if you want to get real fancy i don't know how fancy these people are going to get Aaron, but if you want to get <laughs> real fancy and you're willing to do a lot of linking you could actually get this page, this first page within the module itself for that day and copy this link over and then it would start students here. So it would not take them to the modules page. It would actually take them to this page and then they would work through the module that it's attached to. Um, so that can be done, um, but then you are going to have to re, you have to put in those links daily as far as each particular subject in each particular module you want them to do on the subject. So it really comes down to how much linking you are willing to do. So do yeah, and how often you're willing to link. Correct. Yes, because if you just set it up to the modules page and just put whatever. So let me show you here. So now if I click on this. It's going to take them to the modules page if pretending that this was my reading class. Okay, and so, yes, it takes them to the whole page. Um, but you would then need to be very organized and what shows up in your module, how you name your module as far as what's at the top and what it says. Um, and then that's also where it's really helpful to have that ending page at the end of each day um, so that students know where to stop work for that particular class. Is that. Aaron, do you think that kind of explains that piece of it? Yeah, I think that's the best you can do without okay. them trying it themselves. <laughs> okay. Um, and then we have the hor the home page button that would take students back to whatever home page you want to link to. So remember, if you picked like the crayons or the space theme, and that's the one you're using, um, instead you would need to redo the link of this one, but this one is a link within the course itself. So for this home page one, you could just make this go to the space theme or the crayons theme. So it's only when you are linking from one course to another course that you have to actually mess with this. Okay. If you're linking to pages that are within the same course, then you can use the linking that's on the side here. So that's really your biggest difference between the two. Okay. All right. So that's what <laughs> looks really lovely right now. All right. So that is the basics of the home page. We have, you know, the things then the um, course that we tried to put in enough to get you started. The um, 
this slideshow right here, if we make changes to this, you should not have to go back to the um, comments to get the changes to the slideshow. So this is where we'll try to put updates because this is embedded within the page itself. So changes that are made to the Google Slides update here. So our goal will be to any extra videos or directions or anything else that we want to include, um, we'll make updates to this slideshow itself so that you don't have to worry about, you know, going back to the comments each time we might want to make a little update. The only reason you would need to go back to the comments for, for an update is if we had to add in like a whole nother set of pages or something like that that we don't have right now. Okay. Any other questions, Erin, on this part before I go into other subject area content? Because that's a whole switching of gears. Um, oh. Um, so I just got a question that said, will modules be created for us using the curriculum or is that something they create? So I'll let that's you address that since you have experience there. <laughs> yes, so that <laughs> is where we're actually going to go to next. So that's awesome. That means then it looks like I am ready to move to that part. So let me close out some of these extra things that I have open here. Okay, so I'm going to go back in to my dashboard. All right, so let me give you the information once again that I know to be true at this point in time about what has been created. <laughs> at 1.16 p.m. All right, on yes, timestamp that, please. Timestamp. Okay. <laughs> so the how I ended up getting into all of this and being here today in the first place was because I was asked to come to a meeting with um, some teachers and coaches and things that were just discussing the virtual curriculum because they decided at the elementary level that instead of the district paying to enroll students in other platforms like launch or things like that, which are costly and don't actually necessarily follow what our curriculum is doing, they wanted to then take our district curriculum, but adapt it to make it fit a virtual classroom. So they brought in a team of teachers for each subject area and each grade level that have been working on creating content for um, at least the first quarter. I know they wanted to try to get at least that much done. Um, if they've been able to get farther than that, they can. I know they're still working on it, so um, I'm not sure where they are exactly up to this point because I had to switch gears from helping them do that to working on this training stuff. So the idea was that it would be there so teachers, especially virtual teachers, or any teachers that end up going virtual as the year goes on, would have access to those materials and wouldn't have to start from scratch. They did not say at any point in time that meant that you couldn't adapt or make changes to it, just that they wanted to give you stuff um, that you could use. Um, I, so I have not been told officially that everybody has to use those materials as is. The, it was more created so that you have resources to use. So if you have your own slideshow on the same topic that there's a slideshow in, you know, the sample courses that have been made and you prefer to use yours instead of theirs, as long as it's following district curriculum, I cannot see why that would be an issue. If I get a different answer on that, we will let you know. Um, but the idea was just to give you content so you weren't starting from scratch because what we have created for district students, there's a lot of things that had to be adapted to make it actually fit a virtual world. Aaron, and there, that yes, there's a, someone that was writing curriculum that said math oh. is pretty much done for the semester. Semester, a you guys are three. amazing. Yes, wow. um, EA is done through unit one as of yesterday. Okay. Most of it is editable, but it is in line with our curriculum. That is amazing. I really like I worked with those teachers, I think the first six days that they were working on it, and then I had to switch over to other things. The amount of work and content that they have put together in the last few weeks astounds me and the creativity and the way they're using different platforms and, you know, Google and Nearpod and all of these things and putting together because they were learning how to use all those tools while they were writing this curriculum and adapting it. Right. They have done an excellent job. So even if you choose not to use something, please don't bash on anything that you see 
<laughs> because they have put so much time and effort into it and they really did their absolute best to make it workable for teachers. So I just want to make sure I give a shout out to those people. And I'm glad there's one of you, at least one of you yes. on today. So yes. we really, really, really appreciate all the work you've done to try to make this an easier process for our teachers. It is super, super awesome. All right. So I'm going to go ahead. I have a third grade um, like ELA class that Stephanie shared some information with me, and then I have a third grade math class that Heather shared some information with me. In the math class, I'm just listed as a student, so I can only give you the student view of things. Um, in the ELA class, I think I have teacher access, so I can probably show you both sides. So I'm gonna go ahead and open this here. So the way Stephanie set up her class is she actually set it up like mine so that the linking and all of that would work. I'm going to click on Monday and then I'm going to click on reading. So this is the process by which you could have. Now, if you notice here and that little link came up, she actually linked this to a particular module. So instead of just linking this to a reading modules page, she linked it to a specific day. So keep in mind, we talked about that. You can do that. It's just going to require more linking, but if you want to send students to a specific day, you can absolutely do that. All right. So the, one of the first activities they have is a vocabulary activity, and this is all um, third grade level. So just kind of keep that in mind. Um, they used uh, the program Nearpod, which I'm doing training on tomorrow and Thursday. So if you'd like to learn more about Nearpod, um, you're certainly welcome to come back and listen to me all over again. Um, but in Nearpod is a program that allows you to create interactive slideshows. So for our kids that are 100% virtual, we realize that they can only be live with a teacher for so many hours a day. Like we can only ask them to be on with a teacher for so long. So some of the things like vocabulary, word study, some of those things are created more for students to do independently and Nearpod allows them to do this, but also get content, but also be able to do some formative and summative assessments along the way. Cause you can build in questions. You can build in circling things. You can build in a quiz. You can build in all kinds of things into the lesson itself. So that students are interacting and not cause what they didn't want to have happen was when students were working on their own where they're just clicking through a slideshow because then we don't know if they're actually learning anything. So this is a way to do that. That being said, I don't think anybody is telling you that you have to use Nearpod day one. I'm certainly not going to at my training. It's just an option that you have. Um, and I can see our face to face fourth and fifth grade teachers using it more because they're going to be one to one. Um, and then our virtual teachers certainly using this K3 that are face to face. It's that's going to be more on you if you want to bring in devices and use this. Um, but this one is set up student pace so that students are doing this on their own. The nice thing with Nearpod is it already fills in the student's name um, and it fills it in and everything's done on Canvas. So when we use Google Classroom before, because tech teachers have had Nearpod licenses for a few years. When you use it with Google Classroom, it would open in a Nearpod page and will be completely unconnected to Google Classroom versus with Nearpod in Canvas, it's all done. You don't actually have to leave Canvas to do it. So that's just my little Nearpod plug while we were at it. So students would join the lesson and within the lesson itself, so this is a Lemonade War vocabulary, the teachers um, took slideshows that were with that lesson with the district curriculum or ones that they had created that go along with the district curriculum. They added things, and I don't know that you'll be able to hear this, so I don't think I have this turned on, but. So they recorded directions and they recorded speaking the words. So they knew if this was going to be vocabulary or word study, that it was really important for students to hear the words pronounced correctly. So not only did they import all these into Nearpod and add activities, they also took the time to record audio for each of the slides. So like this is going to read this to the students. And then they have um, some images that go along with it. So that's patient. This is a matching activity where students are matching words to a picture. So like what going on a hike is, what building a sandcastle, because it's all about location. 
Then they have a drawing one where they use the drawing tools. And I will tell you, um, all of our first through fifth grade students um, have used Nearpod in their technology class, and some of them maybe even in their library classes. So really, it's, uh, it's really our kindergartners that will have not seen Nearpod before. Now, it's been a while for those students coming back, but they have seen these Nearpods before. All right, so that is an example of, so then the teacher, they did such a great job with these, and there's a quiz built in. So the teacher then can, since this is an assignment, the teacher then would have the opportunity to go to the speed grader and view each student's work that they did in the Nearpod. So in a virtual classroom, this could be set up more for independent learning. All right, and then we have a page. This is a page of content and you'll notice everything is really well named um, as a the teacher, though, you may even want to go in and name it further and add a particular date. So if you're keeping the module as it is um, with what was created by the virtual curriculum creators, um, I would still add dates to there so that if parents are looking for things that were done in a certain date that they would have that. And they have the lessons set up very similarly. So they have what was live, what the goals are for the day. Um, it has a link to uh, Pearson. Um, we've been told that the integration with Pearson and Canvas is supposed to happen. Um, I don't think it's all been officially set up yet. So the idea will that be that this would then take them to Pearson and sign them in. We're really hoping that that ends up being how that works. But then theory, it's going to work fantastic. Fantastically, I think that's the right way to say it. All right, and then there's an independent reading task. So it gives student directions here. You can always edit this. You could you know, use the audio recorder to record yourself reading the directions, however you wanna do it. Gives them a timer, and then they would go ahead and um, do their reading, and they would answer these questions. Now, since I'm also in this course as a student, I can show you on the student side what this looks like to submit. So I'm going to click on submit here and you'll see that students have two options to submit. So they can submit their answers to these questions in text or they can come over here and submit their answers with recording themselves, um, giving the answers orally to those same questions. OK, so this these were set up so that when the teacher made this assignment, I'll leave the student view here. When the teacher made the assignment, you can see they checked these two boxes. So they wanted to give students these two options in which to submit their answers. So that's how they created it. And then you can then use it that way, or you can uncheck certain boxes. You can you know, change the mode of how you want the submission done if you want, but at least it's set up for you there. And then there's a stop page. So they, she added in, at least for reading, I know for ELA, they tried to add in a stop page then then links back to the schedule for that day. So then they could say, okay, I'm done with reading now. I'm going back to my schedule and I'm going to then go to you know my next class. So that's how the reading looks. Any questions on that reading specific sample? I'm going to show you math here in a minute, but any questions on the reading sample itself? Nothing on the reading okay. example. And this is how it looks like in the modules. So whether or not that ends up in commons and you pull it over or it's pushed into your class, um, you know, this is kind of how it's set up and they used a template maker an add on that we have called city labs to set all these up so that all these letters and days and everything were formatted. Correctly, so if you're wondering how they made that that pretty, they had a template maker that that helped them with that. Um, I guess I can show maybe writing. So let's look at writing here. All right, so this is a page, which means this is just content we are giving to students. So they have a YouTube video that was embedded as grammar lesson. You can see they tried to make little icons, make it very visual. 
they have um, you know what you're learning about and then everything that's live this is the plan for a live lesson for the day now if you're a classroom teacher using these things you could still bring this into your class into your canvas and then you could just use this to teach from to get students used to seeing it so you could play this for the class you could talk them through this um, and then you could use this to leave, lead your live lesson face to face as well. I'm not saying that you have to, but if you want to start getting used to what content is there and getting students used to seeing the, the Canvas um, interactions, then that could be something you would do. And this is what students are seeing when they look at their assignment for the day. Mm -hmm. okay. So anything, so when a student comes to a page that's an assignment, they're going to see this submit assignment page. So they're going to have everything that the teacher created, but then their opportunities to submit at the bottom. Okay, so that's the difference between the teacher. They're at the bottom. The teacher is choosing how students are going to submit the assignment. For the students, they're going to see the box to actually do the submission, whether it's through Canvas, whether it's a Google assignment. So then you would have a, a Google thing to click on here. Um, if it's a Nearpod, it can be attached up here. So it just depends on how, what kind of assignment it is and the ways in which you want to collect student work. Now you can notice here, this one was given a few more options. So they also, because I think it says, yeah, submit a picture of your writing because we realize that students aren't necessarily going to do everything typing wise and not everything works to be a video. Sometimes we just need a picture of things. So when the teacher created the writing assignments, they did what's called a file upload and that lets students then upload a file of a picture file of what they have created. Um, so that's why you'll see here, Save that again. There we go. So if I'm looking from the student view and I hit submit, you'll see that I have the option of choosing a file. Now I do also, it does also give them an option of Google Drive. So if the file is saved to their drive, they can do that. These two came up automatically. We're gonna work on um, restricting some file types. So that's not necessarily always an option there, but um, that is, a way that you can have students do a picture itself. All right. So Hannah, once yes. they submit an assignment, can it be sent back to them if they need to fix something or finish something? Yes, as long as you set it to where you can do, you know, multiple, multiple submissions, submissions, right? When you do that, then students can keep resubmitting. So one of the things that, um, you know, one of the things that was talked about with the teachers creating the curriculum was that it might be good practice to tell the students, like, especially with something with writing, submit whatever you got done today. That way the teacher can take a look at it, can give them some feedback, um, and then they can then make any changes that need to be made. Um, so it might be submit, teacher reviews, gives feedback, student makes changes, resubmit, and start that process over. Because with, depending on how long the writing piece is, especially with some of our longer grade or older grades, that might, you know, be a several step process. And then we have that same screen when it comes to being done with writing. All right, let me make, look back here at our modules and see if there is, those are all reading, writing, Oh, here's word study. Let me give an example of word study too. Oops. Okay. So here's word study. Once again, they're using Nearpod because this is done independently. So Nearpod is one of your easiest options for interaction with slideshows. Um, so they read what vowels are. They talk about what consonants are. Um, and then they have some different um, video slides. So this is like a YouTube video that's been embedded into Nearpod. And then there's another video. And then in the drawing slides, they're then taking their drawing tools and they are um, dividing up the words into syllables. And the directions are also read. So they recorded the directions here so that students could 
follow along and that way if they couldn't read the directions here, they still know what they're supposed to do for each word. So that's an example of a Nearpod word study assignment. And word study is usually pretty short. So a lot of those were created because they thought a lot of word study, especially in the older grades, is going to be done um, independently, that that was how they created a lot of those. All right. I think then that covers all the three subjects that Stephanie put into this. Yes, that looks about right. All right, Erin, any other things you think I need to address before I go to math? I say move it, move it. All righty, got to move it, move it. Let's do it. <laughs> All right, now in math, I am only in this course as a student. I don't know, maybe Heather didn't dress me as a teacher. I'm just kidding. Um, so when I look at these modules, I'm only going to be able to show you the student view. I'm not going to have that edit button to be able to do any of those, but it'll still give you an idea of what is here. So if I am starting with chapter one, day one, so you can see here with math. So with like the reading, they did all the modules and then with math, they do like chapters and days. That's how they organize their templates. So I have my live button here, which means this would be what I would be doing live with students. Um, and they have some teacher directions and things for you. And then they have some sample questions that students would be doing live. So they, students might be working on a dry erase board at home or something like that. Once again, if you are a face-to-face -face teacher, you could import this and use this just as the way that your mode of instruction to get students used to what this looks like. That's just an option for you. And then this is guided learning. So you see it's still live here, live button. So this would be more of teacher direction. So for math, you know, the things that are done live, they try to just put into pages that would be teacher directions, which means that you wouldn't necessarily make these pages published to students, right? You might just keep these as pages you're doing your own, unless you think it would be helpful for any students that were absent to have this and to see what was done in the class. Um, it you know, might depend on what is listed on the page. So if you think it'd be helpful for any absent students to see the whole lesson and all the information, you could do that. That's an option. And then you have your actual sub, um, submit assignment here. So it says display the following plate, I cannot speak, place value chart, write the number as a base 10 numeral and a number name, show thinking by uh, using Canvas video or take a photo of work and upload. So when I go to submit here, I have uh, my variety of options. So I can do my uploading and things of my assignment. So I can take a picture or I can record the video of my work that I have done. And I don't think that Heather has a, yeah, this is day two. She doesn't have a stop page on hers yet. Um, but I, th I think that is a good strategy to put those stop pages in for sure. So then this would be chapter one, day two, fluency. So this is your live lesson for fluency. And this is still all third grade. This is your live lesson for place value. So this takes the teacher through what they can talk with the students about, gives them anchor charts that they can show, all kinds of good stuff there. And then this is the assignment for students. So this is uh, fill in the blanks so they can use Canvas video, take a photo, upload. You could also, if you preferred having this in a Google Doc and attaching this, uh, making this assignment a Google um, assignment instead, you can do it that way. Um, you know, I, I really think they are okay with you making this fit your classroom. They just wanted to have you have something to start from. So if you wanted to adjust the assignment type or how it was collected or whatever, you know, you are going to be able to make some of those decisions as far as I know. All right, and that's another fluency there. So let me check here if there's anything that looks a lot different. I think most of these, she just gave a lot of similar type of examples. So there's fluency guided learning assignment. Yep. Okay. 
So that is more of the math content. Now, science and social studies, I've only briefly viewed and I don't have access to any of their content right now. Um, I think that there's a lot of similar types of things where they broke it up, you know, by chapters and such, and then they embedded Google stuff, they embedded Nearpod stuff, they give you opportunities to upload videos. It's going to be similar types of activities to what you see here in the math and in the ELA subjects. All right, Aaron, what do you think I'm missing here? I think you're nailing it. All right, do you think I need to go into more of create assignment creation stuff? Um, I think they're going to be given a lot, okay. so I don't know. Okay. Well, I will. Let's. We'll give everybody a minute. If you have um, questions that you would like to ask, we do still have some time that's left. Like I said, we were gonna, we uh, you know have accomplished what we had set out for today, but we are certainly welcome um, any further questions that you might have about anything that we've talked about today or this morning. Certainly feel free to ask. Okay. Ah, uh, yes. Thank you, Melody. She's one of our creators. Um, yeah, so another thing is virtual teachers are going to have um, a packet of things that are going home because we realize that we can't have students on, even if they're a virtual student, we can't have students on a computer all day, every day, just like we can't have them live and on a computer all day, every day. We can't have them, um, you know, uh, staring at a screen for that many hours a day either. So there are going to be things that students do that are not, um, you know, going to be virtual things. They're going to be done on paper or they're going to be reading a real book or things like that. Yeah. Thank you for all that clarification, Melody. Can you go back like you were going to submit an assignment? Oh, sure. um, they're wondering like what this, so you were seeing exactly what a student would see. Mm -hmm. uh, so let me go back into math because I'm in math as a student. Okay. So once they click on the blue submit assignment, it takes them to how they have to submit it at the bottom. And then Correct. It is a button at the bottom. I don't know if yeah, it actually so submits, me... but. Okay, so submit. And then I could then choose a file. Now I'm going to pick a random file on my computer. They're going to get my camping banner. Not a picture, but that's okay. And then yes, then I'm going to click on the actual submit. And then for students, they get their confetti. Aaron and I like the confetti and the balloons there. That Yay, I'm so that. glad he turned it on. <laughs> yes, that's exciting. Um, and then you will see if it was set up to be allowed to resubmit, then that button's going to change to resubmit instead of submit. Now in ELA, because I know they have one where students can record. Oops, I picked the wrong course, third grade. So if I'm in my modules here, and I think, I can't remember which one that they could record an answer. I think it was this one. So here, yes, so if I submit, I get the option between typing an answer or using this media. And then if students do this, then they get that whole same thing that the teacher has when they can record themselves, students get the same thing. So then they would do the recording and save it and then their recording file would show up and then they could hit submit or and you had yes, you had ahead. different options based on how it was set up by the teacher. So you yes. as the teacher have the choice to say if you want a video or if you want a file. Correct. So it's so if you're using canvases built in stuff that is an online submission. Okay. And then text entry gives you the text box media recordings gives you that record media where they can record themselves. And then if you want a picture that's a file, that's that file upload. Now you can rest restrict file types. That gets a little tricky though, because you don't know what kind of file type that parents are going to um, 
be using. So I probably would not do many restrictions on that because you don't want to block a parent from being able to add their picture. That's just going to cause you more um, frustrations there. And then you can see here right now it's set to allowed attempts unlimited. So that's why you will have that um, resubmit button. Um, can you show, I don't know if it would be in this course or a different one, if a student were to submit a video recording or a picture, what that would look like on the teacher side. Okay, let me go to, well, I didn't actually record anything, so let me try that first. I don't know that I have any recording pre-save, so we will try to do this in real time here. All right. All right. Here is my sample recording. All right, so I'm going to save. I love the screen grab they give of your face. It's just fantastic. All right, so I'm going to click submit assignment. I didn't get confetti that time, Erin. That's sad. Okay, so then I am going to go to grades. We'll see if you know, here's my here's my stuff I did. All right, I don't remember. I think it might have been day one. Let's see here. Yes. Okay. Actually, I think I need to do this from the teacher. Yeah, speed grader. Sorry. I went somewhere I didn't need to go. I can just co click on speed grader here. Zero one submissions are graded. So I this page is because I'm set in this class as a teacher and a student. So the student side is where you have that submit assignment that the teacher doesn't have. And then the teacher side is where you have the edit and the speed grader button. So just to try to clarify, if you don't see all of those things, that's because you're probably in there in just one role instead of two. All right. Where is my, oh, click here to view. So this submission is a media recording, click here to view. So then it's going to load. Hopefully it doesn't take too long. Boy, if they send a long recording. And it could be too, because I literally just recorded it. So it might still be processing it within Canvas itself before it's actually able to show that. So we might not be able to grab it right now because it's probably still processing the video that I just made. If I had made it a while ago, I'm guessing we would have that, but it will load and it will bring the video up here on the speed grader page. And then you can give students a grade and comments and you can actually give them a video comment back. So if they sent you a video and you want to reply with a video, then you can do that as well. So the student video will come up here, but Canvas is still processing it. And then the teacher video you can send back um, as a media comment, or you can send them um, a word comment as well. So. Sorry guys, this isn't loading yet. Um, it knows that there's something there. Let me see if I can refresh the page. But I don't know if it's processed enough. Oh, there it is. Okay, so that's what it would look like on the student. I just had to give it enough time and refresh the page there. Um, we just had a question about the assignment grades going right into SIS from Canvas. I'm gonna let okay. you do that one, Hannah. <laughs> oh yeah, because I know so much about that. <laughs> you just <laughs> You're so okay, <laughs> so what we know is that you can connect your gradebook to SIS and that you can designate um, and it's and from what Nick has told us now he hasn't actually showed us shown us whatever word that is um, how this actually really goes yet, but he said you set it up for one time at the beginning of each semester because our courses in SIS are set by semester. Um, and then once you have that connection made, you don't have to keep connecting that course to the SIS course. And then anything you type in here, then you can choose if that assignment ends up in SIS itself. So you set up the connection at the beginning of each semester between that a particular course and that course in SIS. And then as the teacher, once you set up that connection, then from there on out, you can decide which of those grades from this gradebook get connected to SIS. And from what we understand is that if you change your grade here, it will sync, I think he said overnight, Erin, if I'm not mistaken, it will sync overnight 
with this. So if you have a student that redoes an assignment and you have to redo a grade, he said that it should show up on this list end. I think what we're not sure about is if you change, if you're actually in SIS and change the grade, it will not change over in Q. Oh, I, yeah, I don't think he said it works back that way. Right. So I think you just have to be careful about where you're putting or how you're doing that. Right. And with K2 teachers, he is still figuring out how that works with the standard base grading because he still is very unclear about how our standards based grading report card looks and works. Um, I can tell you if you're a specialist on here as a specialist teacher, since I only give a score at the end of the quarter, even though I will house my grades in Canvas, I'm not necessarily going to connect that course to SIS because I'm just going to look at my grades in Canvas to determine um, the final score for the quarter. Would you agree with that, Erin? 100% yes. Okay. okay. So, uh, yeah, go ahead. You know, go ahead. Um, I was just going to say, so for, you know, specialists versus classroom teachers, you may be using the whole grade book portion differently. That's all I was going to say. So, um, Can you speak to where parents or kids will see comments that you make to them on an assignment? Um, I believe it's in the assignment itself, if I am not mistaken. Let me go into... So I have my own, I have some sample students in my, this course right here. I'm sorry that I don't have this pulled up already. We're doing this on the fly, Erin. I like it. We're doing great. <laughs> All right. So let's say I have an assignment that I have then graded for a student. So let me look at. I don't know if I have any kids that have submitted this or not, but we're going to open up and speak greater and see. All right, it says no submission, but I'm going to give them a score anyways. Okay. Hopefully it will allow me to do that. All right, so then if I go in and then I give them a comment, please do this, oops, do this assignment. Okay, comment has been submitted, giving them a score. Okay, so then I'm going to go in as that demo student. I'm going to go back to Canvas. I'm going to open up that course on the student side. All right, and then, oh goodness. I don't remember, do you remember the name of the <laughs> assignment? I think it was example assignment. Let's take a look. Uh, you know what? It might show up on grades, which I think I have hidden right now. Or is it under like announcements? Like, do they get like a notification basically? Mm -hmm. Okay, let's take a look. I'll go back in and try again. I used Canvas as a college student and I don't remember where there. It is. Oh, no, no, that's this. That's your announcement. Oh, recent feedback. Here we go. Right here. On the right hand think, side. Yep, right here. So it's going to show up on their feedback here and it's going to show them my comment. Please redo this assignment. And if there's a media comment, um, it's going to show that too. So that's where it's going to show up for students. Sorry, guys. Aaron and I have done a deep dive into Canvas, but we found out <laughs> that the bottom is still much farther down than we realized. So, all right. So that's where that information is going to come up. Recent feedback right there. Okay. Um, we have Anything a question else about, we can clumsily answer. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, a, a question about parents having access to what the students do on Canvas like they did in classroom. So it's, we know it's going to be better access than it was in classroom. Um, there is like a Canvas actual parent app that's separate from like there. So when, if you go to the app store, there's a Canvas parent app, a teacher app and a student app. So as a parent, you can view your students' assignments and things without actually having to sign in as a student, as your child, versus that whole weekly summary thing that Google Classroom gave that was really not all that helpful and, you know, came at the end of a week and all that kind of stuff. So 
Um, I do know that parents can get notifications and that they can view student work. Exactly how detailed that looks, um, we are going to be, you know, that's part of the parent training and part of what Jamie is supposed to be helping create for us with parent tutorials and things like that of what parents need to download and, and how to get all of that access. So that is about as much as Aaron and I know on that topic at this moment, unless Aaron, you have any more information than I do. I am not withholding anything secretive okay. over here. <laughs> Man, I was hoping you had a secret cache of information over there. Yeah. So I do know that it's better. And then I do know that parents have like their own individual app and that they can get notifications. Um, but because we don't have parents imported into courses yet, that's something that we haven't really had much opportunity to play. With. Yes. And we do also know that if you have a discussion board where students are responding to each other, parents will not have access to see that because they yeah. should not be seeing other students' names and such. So Correct. Thank no you. matter what their access is, they would not be able to see anybody, any other students. Right, so only their own child's work. Thank you, Garen, that is true. We do know that much. <laughs> All right, anything else coming through? Nothing crazy right now. Okay. Well, we didn't do too badly. It's almost two o'clock. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you all for coming, especially if this is your second time today that you have joined us. You've given us a lot of hours of your day. So we really, really appreciate that. I'm going to stop sharing that. Yes, you made it worth our while. Yeah. So thank you for all of your questions, too. You guys had awesome questions. And that helps us as trainers and going back to the other trainers of uh, because, you know, you'll have some building specific Canvas training, too. That helps us to know what things do we still need to get answers for and what things do we we need to address further? What pieces of Canvas do we still have questions about that people need answers to? So it's not, you know, if we didn't answer your questions today, we are going to work on getting those answers or getting to the right people that have the answers to those questions. So, all right. Well, thank you so much for joining us and we hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Yes. Bye. Bye.